Lord be with you. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It's a joy to be with you today to continue our Easter celebration. Again, I want to say what I said last week. Thank you to so many of you who put in time behind the scenes, who put in time setting up and feeding and cleaning up and music and the choir and our instrumentalists, like I mentioned. So many people made Holy Week such a special week for us this year, and I can't say thank you enough to so many of you for making that happen. It's a joy to serve here at Zion and to worship at Zion, so thank you for making those uh, special worship services. There are a number of announcements there for you in your worship folder. I'm not going to take time to go through those right now other than to highlight one of them, which is, I think, really exciting. So... Uh, and I'll put this out there because some of you may not be on this email list and may, would, may like to be. And so if you are interested, drop your email off in the church office. But every month I put together a mission and ministry update. And that's it's the video with a PowerPoint slide that I put together and narrate. And then email that out to everyone in the church we have email addresses for. So if we don't have yours, give it to us. But in that email, up, that email update, that mission and ministry update, I highlight different things going on in the life of the congregation, celebrations, uh, sorrows that we share together, upcoming celebrations, and then opportunities. Well, uh, one of the opportunities I've mentioned is simply supporting our preschool. And one of the uh, individuals watching saw that and said, we would like to do that. In fact, we'd like to offer a matching gift opportunity. So they've offered a matching gift of up to $5,000 which is incredibly generous. Uh, if you would like to give to support the preschool, your gift will be matched and uh, will be a blessing to our preschool for years to come. So if you have questions about that, certainly you can visit with me, or you can simply write a check and drop it off, and that gift goes directly to our preschool to bless our children and our families in our church and in our community. So uh, just a neat idea that this, uh, this individual had, and I want to make you aware of it as an opportunity you have to, to participate. Okay, that was, that's the only announcement I have. I'll have one brief announcement at the end. At the end, I'm going to invite Jen Morris forward to give an update on, from our Safety and Security Committee. They've been doing excellent work going through a lot of our policies and protocols so forth at Zion, and she has some things she's going to share on behalf of that committee at the end of the service, so we'll get to that then. Let's go ahead and turn to our opening song. <laughs>
have you remain seated. We're going to be reviewing here in just a moment uh, part of our catechism, which talks about what confession is. It's a good review because every Sunday we begin our worship service with confession of sins and absolution, and we want to make sure that we are reviewing what we're doing and why we're doing it. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. What sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Which are these? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? Now very briefly so we understand what we just did. So we're going to have a moment, in just a moment, a period of silence where we have a moment to reflect upon our sin. These are the sort of questions we should be asking during that time. Also, these are the sort of questions we have the opportunity to ask before we receive Holy Communion on Communion Sundays. And I think if we ask these questions, they have the ability to be very piercing because we realize, uh, yeah, I've done that and that and that. Oh, man, this is getting bad, right? So we realize our need to confess and our need for forgiveness. And then the gift that God is going to give through the spoken word of forgiveness and through the sacrament of forgiveness at the sacrament of the altar. So, we continue. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. He remembers his covenant forever the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now, and will be forever. Amen. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. We sing our hymn. Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. A couple quick things about this text. This is important because sometimes individuals will grab this text and try to make it say what it's not saying. In particular, this text and others in the first few chapters of Acts have often been grabbed by those who wish to endorse a a form of government called socialism. And that's basically, most of you know this, but for younger individuals, socialism is basically when you sign over your personal property rights to the state and they redistribute property and wealth according to their plan. That is not what's happening in this text for a few reasons, and I want to lay those out so as you hear the text, you understand this. If you read the text carefully in the larger context, so the few chapters surrounding it, what you're going to see in the book of Acts, you don't see a once and for all divestiture or a a giving over of property to a state to manage, but you see periodic acts of great charity as need arises, number one. Number two, you see acts of generosity that are completely voluntary. So again, socialism is the forced redistribution 
of wealth. That's important to understand. And number three, these descriptive accounts are not prescriptive. In other words, describing what early believers did does not constitute a command that we have to follow. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be generous people. We most certainly, certainly should. But the Bible's not giving you a command to sell all that you have and to give it over to a governing body to redistribute. There's no command to do that. So again, what you see are periodic acts of charity, not a once and for all thing. You see acts of generosity that are completely voluntary. And you see a description, not a prescription. Now, our little text is just one little piece, but if you read the chapter surrounding it, you can get a fuller picture. That's really, really important. Okay, verse 32 is where we begin. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second text is from 1 John chapter 1. A couple things in this text. You are going to hear something that should sound very familiar to you, because this is a section of text from part of our liturgy comes from. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins, right? That comes right out of 1 John. So you're going to hear that come out. And also, you're going to hear that great word, propitiation. I know it's not a word we use very often. But propitiation has to do with, with Jesus turning away God's wrath. That he absorbs it into himself and turns it away from us. So you'll hear that word. Just know that propitiation means that Jesus, as the propitiator, is the wrath turner awayer. Okay, that's basically what the word means. Okay, beginning with verse number one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as we sing together our Alleluia and verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse number 19. It is the evening of that first Sunday of the resurrection. 
On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. Kids, come on up and find a seat. Come find a seat, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good, good. You're going to sit there. That's good. That's good. Come find a seat. Okay, thanks for coming up. I'm really excited to talk to you about what we read from John's Gospel. All right? So you have this amazing account where the disciples are hiding. Think about that. They were hiding, not hide and seek, but hiding because they were afraid. Do you know, do you know why they were afraid? Does anyone know why they were? Why would they be afraid? What do you think? Well, yes, they should be fearful of the wrath of God, but in this case, they were afraid of the people who had arrested Jesus and killed Jesus. And they were afraid if they could arrest Jesus and crucify him, then what could happen to them? Same thing, right? So they were hiding. The door is locked, and Jesus appears in the room. That must have been the most amazing thing. Now, one of them, Thomas, he wasn't there. And when they told Thomas, hey, you're not going to believe this. We, we saw Jesus. Thomas said, you're right. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Unless I can touch here, here, and here. Unless I can touch him and see him, I won't believe it. Well, it was eight days later. And they were in the room again, hiding, scared. And Jesus came. Thomas was there. And Jesus, remember, Thomas wasn't in the room when Jesus was first there. And Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said, I won't believe it. But Jesus knew what Thomas said. And he said, Thomas, come over here. Come over here. Put your hands, right, put your fingers here. Touch, touch my scars and see that it's me and I'm alive. Now, I want you to understand something. When Jesus died, remember, they treated Jesus very badly. They hurt Jesus a lot. But Jesus kept those scars when he rose from the dead. And when Jesus appeared to Thomas, he wasn't just doing it for Thomas. Do you know who else he was doing it for? You. That's right. Because Jesus 
allows us to see and touch him through the eyes and fingers of Thomas. Jesus wanted Thomas and us to know that he's really alive. So when Thomas saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus had this amazing thing, and he was talking about you. Did you know Jesus was talking about you? He says, blessed are those who have not seen me like you've seen me, Thomas, but they believe. And he was talking about you. Blessed are you. You weren't there in that room. You weren't there with Thomas to get to see and touch. But Jesus appeared to Thomas so Thomas could see and touch, and we get to see and touch through Thomas. And Jesus says, blessed are you. That Jesus is really alive. And one more thing. Do you know what those disciples did after they saw Jesus alive? They didn't stay hiding. They went out and told everybody because they were no longer afraid. Yep, they could have still been arrested and put to death, and many of them were. But they knew that their God raised the dead. And so they weren't even afraid of death because God was going to raise them from the dead and raise us from the dead and give us life everlasting. So nothing scared them anymore. Pretty awesome stuff. Yes. And we can see it in here from the Bible. That is exactly right. That's what we have the Bible to tell us about it. You're exactly right. Good job. Thanks for your good listening. You guys can head back to your seats and we sing our next hymn. <laughs> Grace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today through our gospel reading from John chapter 20. There's enough material in our reading for at least two sermons today because the text breaks down into two neat sections. The first section in which Jesus breathes on his apostles, giving his 
apostles the Spirit. And the second section in which Jesus interacts with unbelieving Thomas, and Thomas is moved upon seeing the risen Jesus to confess, my Lord and my God. We don't have time to address both today, so we're going to leave unbelieving, evidence-demanding Thomas for another time and focus on the life-giving breath spirit of God. Before we do, though, I want to take you back to the beginning of John's Gospel to show you something that will help us appreciate what John narrates here in our text in chapter 20. So the first few verses of John are perhaps the most well-known in all of Scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, there's obviously a lot there. But for our purposes, we just need to zero in on the first three words. In the beginning. And when you hear those words, John wants you to have a deja vu moment. He wants you to think, I've heard those words before. And you probably know where. The very first verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John is connecting the creative word of God spoke in the beginning, the creative life-giving word of God, God spoke to bring all things into existence. John is connecting that word to Christ. In fact, he's saying that word is Christ. So Jesus is the life-giving, life-creating Word of God. Now, keep that in mind as we come to our text from John chapter 20. Let's remember where we are in the narrative. So last week we read the first section of John 20 where Mary Magdalene is surprised by life. She comes to Jesus' tomb looking for death only to be surprised by life. Now, it's Sunday evening in our text, and John narrates. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, we're concerned today only with the last couple sentences. First John's statement, Jesus breathed on them. This is another deja vu moment. You've heard this before. God has breathed before. Where? Well, remember John's interest in creation. Genesis 2 recounts the creation of man. The Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. So God breathes life into Adam. God's breath is a life-giving breath. And here Jesus breathes on his disciples, giving them the Holy Spirit. So God is doing something life-giving through the Spirit, through this breath. And look what Jesus says. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, you may wonder what forgiveness has to do with life or how it's connected to life. But think about this in terms of the creation account. What brought death? What is it that brought death into creation. Sin. So if sin brought death, what is it that will bring new life? 
forgiveness. Jesus is initiating a new creation through the Spirit, through this apostolic office, through the apostolic office that will be filled by called pastors announcing and giving the Spirit-empowered gift of forgiveness and new life. Let me say it another way. Through the working of His Spirit in His church, God, by forgiving sins, is making people new. So forgiveness is more than just getting rid of sin. It's more than settling an account, more than paying a debt or, endure, or having simply a penalty endured for us. That's part of forgiveness, yes. But forgiveness is the means by which God does his work of new creation. The means by which he makes us new. And he is specifically doing this work in his church specifically doing this work through the apostolic office in which the churches called pastors serve. So let me make sure you're grasping this. God is working through the apostolic office to which the churches called pastors have been called to make people new, to make you new. And this is truly life-giving. Let's talk about why. It has to do with guilt. So I'm going to say this as plainly as possible, maybe even bluntly. We all have guilt. All of us. Some of us are struggling under its burden with it strapped to our backs. Some of us have guilt hiding in the cellars of our soul that gnaws at us from the inside, threatening to eat its way out. Some of us have guilt loops in our minds that are constantly accusing us and damning us. But we all have guilt. Maybe it's an addiction, an overpromising, under-delivering idol that you just can't shake. Maybe it's a relationship you destroyed, trust you broke. Maybe it's responsibility you neglected, years of foolishness and selfishness, a life wasted on trivial and pointless pursuits. Maybe you feel guilty about failing your kids or your spouse. Maybe you've wasted money, a lot of it. Maybe you gambled it away for nothing for nothing but just the rush of it. Maybe you've consumed thousands of hours of empty, mind-numbing media and you're completely ill-equipped to engage meaningfully and thoughtfully in the pressing questions of our day. Maybe it's something that happened years ago or maybe it's something that happened just last week. Whatever it is, we all have guilt. So here's my question. What are you doing with yours? What are you doing with your guilt? Are you turning to man-made solutions for your guilt? Because you knew, we know we do that, don't you? We do this. It's not something we're really open about, but we do it, and it's destructive. Man-made solutions to guilt are destructive. So how are you dealing with your guilt? Are you turning to substances to dull the pain or to silence those condemning voices, something to make the guilty feelings go away at least for a few hours? Are you turning to self-harm, trying to punish yourself, trying to make yourself hurt enough so that you feel like you've finally atoned for your sins? Are you turning to food? Not for delight or nourishment, but guilt, to swallow it down. Are you turning to some addictive or destructive behavior in hopeless resignation, a sort of, what's the point of trying because I never get better? What are you doing with your guilt? And is it working? Is it eliminating the guilt? Or look what's happening in our culture. 
I mean, what do you think so much of the activism is about? What is so much of the anti-racism activism and the sexual ideology activism about? It's not about healing and tolerance and inclusivism. It's about innocence signaling. It's about finding a way to say publicly, I'm a good person. I'm not guilty of those sins being condemned by our culture. And it's about finding a group that we can pin the guilt on. Finding a group that we can forever label oppressor, victimizer. About finding a group that will bear our cultural guilt for us so that we can feel morally pure. And is destined to fail. Not because there aren't injustices and evils in our culture, because there most certainly are probably not where our culture is eager to identify them, but there are injustices and evils in our culture. But it's destined to fail because there's no forgiveness at all. There's only blaming and shaming and framing and inflaming. There's no life in that. That just pits one group against another in this endless battle of shaming and assigning guilt. You're guilty. No, you're guilty. And this endless marathon of innocence signaling, I'm a good person. No, I'm a good person. Where every day you have to blame somebody else for the latest and constantly changing culturally identified sins. But it is never enough. Never we will never do enough to make ourselves new. We will never find a way in and of ourselves to deal with the guilt. We can't silence it. We can't eliminate it. We can't swallow it. We can't atone for it. We can't do enough activism for politically correct causes to signal it away. We can't put it on a group that we've labeled guilty. The answer must come from beyond us. It must come from God himself. And it does. God has a way to deal with guilt. It's called forgiveness. And it's just as astonishing today as it was on the day when Jesus authorized his apostles to bring it into the world. And I want you to understand what Jesus was saying to them. He wasn't merely saying if somebody sins against you, you can and should forgive them. He was saying, you, by the power of the life-giving spirit that I am giving you and by the authority vested in the apostolic office, you have the power to forgive the sins of everyone. That's why the apostolic office, the office to which pastors are called to serve, that's why it's such a gift to Christ's church and to the world. I mean, God could have sent an email or a snap, but he chose to sin forgiveness in person, in and through pastors who stand in Christ's stead and speak his word of forgiveness to repentant sinners racked by guilt. The small catechism, after citing the words that we read from John 20 on forgiveness in the apostolic office, succinctly puts it this way, I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular, when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. So God establishes an office to bring forgiveness to you in person. And this forgiveness is truly life-giving because it releases you from your guilt. Releases you from your guilt. You don't have to carry it. You don't have to listen to its accusations. You don't need to blame somebody else. You are forgiven. Yes, there may be certain wounds that remain due to sin, certain residual effects of sin that linger, but your standing before God is rectified you are forgiven, you have been made new. 
through the working of God's Spirit, He breathes new life into you. You have been made new. You are a new creation. I mean, drink that in every day. I am a new creation of God. Jesus' blood was shed for me. I am forgiven. I have been made new. You get that down into the marrow of your being and then live free. You don't have to atone for your guilt. It's done. Done. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven. You are a new creation of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. We now have the opportunity to confess the faith of the Christian church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to stand. And with joy and boldness we confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Children, you can bring your offering forward. In choir, we invite you forward.
Thank you, choir. Taylor, it's great to have you join us on the weekend and, and visit. We're always happy to have you sign, and this adds just that dimension of, of texture to the music and beauty to it, so thank you, Taylor. Choir, we are so happy to have you back, and singing certainly enhances our worship. So make sure you tell the choir thank you when you see them, because, and you can, you can applaud, because I, I just think, um, thank you. It's just, it's really, really encouraging to have you bless our worship with song, and I know that all of you are grateful to have the choir sing, and Taylor, you as well, to sign for us. Let us stand to pray. Lord God, we rejoice with Thomas and the apostles to know that you are risen. We rejoice to hear the word of forgiveness that you bring by the working of your spirit through the apostolic office into your church, where you make us new, where you release us from guilt and how desperately we need release from guilt. We are a people racked by guilt, and so often we deal with it in such destructive and harmful ways to ourselves and to others. But Lord, turn us away from these man-made solutions for guilt and turn us to what you offer us in Jesus Christ, forgiveness from our guilt, right standing before you, and the ability to bring forgiveness in our lives to those who have sinned against us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, there are many for whom we care. Many will be named at this altar. Many left unnamed. We ask even that you would hear the cries of our hearts for those not named, but we name before you Naomi Adams, Alan Grimm, Jeannie Groon, Ron Schilling, Sherry Steffes, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Natalie Mason, John Sonickson, Gage Carlson, Meredy Bowman, Patty Meaves, Beth Vitrito, Mary Grimm. We entrust them to your care, asking for grace for each day and healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we grieve with those who grieve, with those who have grief that is prolonged, those who have grief that is fresh. Especially today, we think of the Schrader family, as they grieve the death of Fred, Joyce's brother. Give them comfort and hope and the promises of reunion and resurrection, that all of us who grieve may find comfort in knowing that death will not have the last word. Jesus will, and his word is life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our missionaries, Pastor Oliver, Pastor Vogel, Pastor Ferry, Pastor Monti, Pastor Sharp, for cross-cultural worker Molly Auerksen, work through their confessing of Christ, that those who hear the gospel by the working of your spirit may be converted to confess faith in Christ and so celebrate forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our military men and women in law enforcement, Scott Stribe, Stephen Grimm, Marshall Hansen, Aaron Stokel, Lillian Ginzen, we pray protection from harm, and that you would give us opportunity to show our gratitude for their service to our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our partnership with Trinity in Manila, that you would strengthen this partnership. For our preschool, that you would bless teachers and students and parents, and that you would raise up for us a new teacher and assistant. That the love of Christ may continue to be shared in the preschool and in our community and beyond. We thank you for hearing our prayers and answering according to your will. And we ask that you hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Be seated. I'm going to have you, go ahead, Jen, have you come up right now, right before our last song. Let me get the microphone on. Just a few minutes, uh, Jen's going to share a message from our safety and security committee. And then we will get to our closing hymn in just a moment. There you go, Jim. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, thank you for giving me a quick moment. As a member of the safety and security team, we just wanted to share one of our goals is to bring forth pieces of the safety and security plan to the congregation. And so today, given that it's springtime, we're gonna go over the severe weather, in particular tornado. So if we um, have a tornado, I guess first of all, I would say that we would ask everyone to be weather aware as they come to church, be aware if there's a chance of severe weather, and our ushers and the elder of the day would also be weather aware. And if there would be a tornado warning issued for our immediate or impending vicinity of Zion, First of all, our area that we would, our area of shelter preference would be the basement bathrooms and the basement hallway. That is the preferred area. But we also know, given our size, other options would be the lower level rooms without windows. And then we also have upper level rooms without windows, like the Sunday school office or storage rooms. And then with Bob Genzen on our team, he was able to help us identify those reinforced thick walls in the education wing make a great place as well. So for those folks who are not able to go downstairs in particular, those would be great areas for them to seek shelter. We would then have the congregation stay in that area until the tornado or severe weather alert has passed. We look forward to sharing with you in the months to come other pieces of our safety plan. The red binder is always out in the fellowship hall and our ushers have worked through a list as well to help keep our congregation safe as we gather for worship. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you to our safety and security committee. And I wanted to point out, I think, Jen, you did a good job of this. She mentioned this red binder over there. You, you may not realize our ushers, you think, oh, how hard, they're just making, handing out bulletins, you know, they count how many people are here. Well, they're actually very involved during the course of a service being attentive to what's the weather situation, um, what's going on in the parking lot. They make trips around the fellowship hall to make sure no one has gotten sick and you know, has passed out somewhere by themselves. Uh, so they're very attentive to what's happening while you are worshiping. And I think uh, that's something for us to be grateful for. And it's great that our safety and security committee has said, what would we do if there were, was severe, severe weather? And where they pointed out where we would go is incredibly useful. And so if you don't know, like if you're here and that's happening, our ushers do know, our elders do know, and they will stand and guide and help lead to where we need to get. So it's good to know they're there, uh, and we say thank you to our safety and security committee and our elders, deacons, and ushers who are working lots of times behind the scenes in ways to make sure that we can worship safely without worrying about what's happening beyond the walls and they're taking care of that. So thank you for all who serve in that capacity. Let's turn to our final song. <laughs> 